Thanks so much, Charlie. So, Charles Park, welcome very much to the first Mac Monday of 2021. Thank you, everyone who's already out there watching and bearing with our site technical issues. It's always a bit of a fiddle getting these things started, but here we are. We're five minutes away still from um, people joining, so we'll give people a few more minutes, Charlie, if that's all right, just to let everyone get here for the 12 o'clock start. But it's good to see lots of people have already joined us, which is always nice. <laughs> Have you had a nice Christmas, Charlie? Has it all been well at home and peaceful? It's been very peaceful, very quiet. And you? Good. Yeah, likewise. Well, as peaceful as life can be when you've got two small boys at home. So <laughs> there's been, um, they're nine and seven. So just at the point where they start driving me a bit more mad than normal. So <laughs> there's been lots of time, lots of hours spent in the woods being outside and, uh, getting rid of all of that excess energy so <laughs> but no it's been it's been good it's and been good enough a separate building for the for the pots in case they run into them oh yes no 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 no. the pots are in the office so we're not the house and the office are now separated we moved into new offices in april last uh, april last year um so it means that the pots are all here well away from the house which is definitely a good thing <laughs> they're pretty good though they've we've not had any accidents with pots with pieces from my own collection they they know which things they're supposed to stay well clear of and they quite like the pots as well so we'll occasionally get them down from the shelf and look at them all together but generally they stay well clear of them so <laughs> do they have favorites uh, they do they like to come to the office and then they come around and having a look at seeing which ones they like um they're not so keen on my Ewan Hendersons. They've got, I've got a large horizontal um, Ewan Henderson piece that ever since they were very small, they've called the scary turtle. So they've never appreciated that one too much. But I've dissuaded them from driving their cars over it uh, a few times. So uh, thankfully that's now well out of the way. So it's all okay. <laughs> so just kicking that over. How are we doing for time? A couple, couple more minutes. All right, we'll just give people a few more minutes, but there's lots of people joining, so welcome everybody. We'll get started as close to 12 o'clock as possible to give everyone a chance to join uh, the first Mac Monday. How many Mac Mondays are you doing, by the way? Well, the idea is to do, the, it's the first Monday of the month each time. Okay. Um, so the idea is to do 12, and we'll try and do a few other things in between as well as opportunities arise. Mm -hmm. But it's just a nice chance to talk about ceramics, talk about pots. We're looking to talk to collectors and to artists and anyone who kind of can bring a, an interesting concept and context into ceramics rather than it just always being about the auctions or the pots that we're selling just having a, a broader conversation which I think is always nice to have um, and mm. opens things up to other opportunities which is good, good idea. and so we're very pleased to be having you I think we'll get started shall we Fern yeah I think we've got lots of people there yeah. a couple of minutes to go so um, everyone else can join us when they're ready um, but yes, yeah, so welcome Charles Park um, to the first Mac Monday where we are talking about the exhibition at the Asmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, it's a Hans Koper 100 to celebrate the centenary of Hans Koper. Um, and obviously, it's uh, as we talked about, we've been trying for, me, for us to get together to come and see it together since it opened. And with each various lockdown, we've been hampered and I've not even managed to make it to see it yet myself in person. So I'm sad to do that. Um, and hopefully things will open up and allow us to do that before the exhibition's due to close because it's been extended, hasn't it, until the 28th of February now, is that right? It has, it has been extended to the end of, end of February, so it takes in the half term. Um, exactly, so hopefully, so hopefully we'll get a chance to come and see it together and hopefully everyone else who hasn't yet been to see it will will be able to do so um but perhaps Charles you'd like to start by telling us a little bit about a well maybe about Hans Koper I mean obviously lots of people who are already familiar with contemporary ceramics can't help but know who Hans Koper is but for anyone else out there perhaps you could tell us a little bit about Hans Koper and his significance within the movement of British studio ceramics uh, thank you, Marika. Um, well, that's, a, that's a very broad, broad question. Um, it is rather. I, I think uh, you know, Hans Koper is really one of the greats. Um, it's not just me saying that. You know, uh, it's it's uh, he exhibited very widely internationally, had huge acclaim, and uh, 
he, he really came at a turning point of, of British ceramics, in my opinion, um, from the school of Bernard Leach, you know, uh, the Japanese uh, aesthetic, to a far more contemporary, urbane, um, sculptural, um, but still using the wheel, um, dialogue um, that was utterly new. Uh, to the ceramics world um, and captured the zeitgeist of that period of production from the 50s to the mid 70s which is when he was really working um, and what is interesting about him is that he didn't really have formal training as such um, uh, he just to give a bit of background so he was obviously born in 1920 he um, he, he escaped Nazi Germany um, uh, in uh, 1939, arrived in the UK, was sent to an internment camp um, and got out of that. And then um, 1946 was introduced to a fellow uh, Austrian um, great ceramicist, Lucy Ree, who at the time was making uh, buttons, moving on to tableware. And uh, she took him off or encouraged him to go on a throwing course. Um, and he did that. And uh, he, he, he'd obviously, you know, experimented with uh, painting and sculpture before, but didn't have formal training. Um, came back from a throwing course and started working in Lucy Rhee's um, studio in, um, in London. And um, uh, very swiftly, you know, developed his own style um, and uh, just started creating just amazing pots mm -hmm. that were very unique at the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, his early works were still kind of very much thrown forms, weren't they? Um, and kind of the vessel, kind of the, the, a pure vessel based and still quite functional in their purpose. Um, but I think that's something that kind of evolved over time, really, hasn't it? Um, I, I think that's right. I think there, there, there were lots of sort of almost decade long periods in his mm. production. And um, uh, you know, there are a couple of, uh, the, the, the nice thing about the show, it has about 40 parts in it at the mm -hmm. Ashmolean. Uh, there are lots of unique things about the show, but one of the nice things is it, it takes it right from the beginning. And as you say, um, there are some very early pieces from the late 40s, early 50s. Um, uh, unusually for Hans Cooper, there are one or two coloured pieces in, in the uh, collection. Oh, really? Um, what, what kind of pieces with the colour, pe what coloured pieces are there? Well, there is a uh, a very light blue. Um, oh, easily amazing! Because I think it obviously came from, you know, surplus glaze that he borrowed from Lucy. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, as you say, it's a single single form, um, but it it, it ha it's you can see where it's going to go um, yeah. at later stages. But if you his early work was very much um, big, uh, mm. monumental. Uh, brown and white, often with images on them. Um, they were or, much more kind of decorated, weren't they? The early works with the scraffito kind of scratching and design. Um, and like you say, quite, il quite illustrative for some pieces. There's those amazing dishes with kind of horses and birds, aren't there? Um, very, very, yeah, very illustrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, you know, the, where he started um, mm -hmm. and uh, experimenting with you know uh, that scratching and etching and they were they were i think already you know images that he had absorbed from you know going around the british museum um mm. that were starting to appear in abstract form mm. uh, in these uh, bowls and dishes um and i think they're they're wonderful early pieces and then he goes he leaves uh, lucy uh, and moves to um hertfordshire uh, to go work at Digswell, mm. uh, where the the next period of his evolution takes place, where he's it's much more architectural. He knows it's called the architectural period um, by his biographer, and um, they are the start of. Well, he does he does the cathedral um, candlesticks. Yeah, and he does important. Uh, very important. He does um, discs which end up in, in a school um, that you can see through um, that are on either side of a wall. 
Um, he does lots of uh, tiles, ceramic tiles, um, acoustic tiles. Mm. Um, and he, he, at the same time, you can start to see that he's starting to uh, make composite parts. So he's going from the mono form uh, with Lucy in mm. Lucy Studio to, you know, two forms or more in uh, pieces. He then comes back to London, carries on with these ideas uh, before moving into uh, Somerset in Frome, mm. where he moves on to what some people call the Cycladic period, mm. which is another thing that we try to pick up in the in the exhibition. Uh, one of the hazards of the uh, virus is that the location of the exhibition within the Ashmolean has moved a few times. Oh, uh, oh really? <laughs> but, but fun enough, I think it's ended up in just the right place. It's it's surrounded by fantastic art from um, you know minus three thousand BC, um, and it moves into uh, Hans Koper in from the nineteen you know fifties nineteen seventy. That's amazing because those, it, those early influences were really important to him. The kind of the early kind of. Um, yeah, kind of pre is it pre Columbian or Etruscan period or pieces and things like that were were very important in his influence, especially in his kind of early design, but also in his later forms. Isn't that right? That is right, and I think um, you know people um, dispute the influence, but I think we've got at least three or four examples in the Ashmolean of yeah. direct reference to the ancient world. Um, there is a wonderful lekythos, which was uh, a container for holding olive oil. Um, yeah. Ancient Greece, a uh, monumental uh, vase that Hans Koper produces that is very similar in aspect. There's a small uh, Corinthian arabellos, again from um, several thousand BC, um, yeah. which uh, with a, has a disc on the top. So a round form at the base, and then a little neck, and then a round disc at the top. Oh, really? So uh, yes, really. Uh, identical uh, piece to yeah. some of the ones that Hans Gerber was producing. And then finally, in Cycladic period, again, mm. looking back to minus 3000 BC, yeah. there are these wonderful um, sculptural uh, figures um, produced in the Cyclades in, in Greece that emerge in Hans Gerber's form um, yeah. in the 70s. Uh, in, in Somerset with him, which are his yeah. later, much more uh, refined, um, subtle, um, elegant, but still very monumental, not big, yeah. uh, probably 30 yeah. centimetres high. No, they're small scale, but enormous presence, those works, don't they? So I not think that's one of the things that I'm so hoping to get the chance to see when we go to the Ashmolean is because I think his work is interesting on an individual level. I think any one of his works, they stand alone and they stand beautifully alone and you don't need to have a group of them for them to make the impact, but the impact of them when you do see them in a large group, and especially when you can see the evolution from his of his career, but also the evolution of a form, because often you'd start, he'd start with a form, wouldn't he, where there would be perhaps a slightly larger scale, slightly I don't know, rougher, is not the right word, but slightly, you can see how he takes the form as, as a starting point and then it gets refined to almost to an ultimate point where he feels like then he can't go any further with it. He's achieved all that he can achieve with that form. And then he takes a side step and then perhaps takes elements of that form to start in a different direction. And I think that comes across so beautifully when you get to see those works in a group as you have managed to get together at the Ashmolean. And so how, how did the exhibition with the Ashmolean come about? Because I understand that there are about 40 pieces in the collection um, and then about 30 pieces have come from private collectors, but there's also works from the Ashmolean's personal, well, from the Ashmolean's collection in there as well. So was this an idea, did you have the idea that you would like to do this exhibition and approach the Ashmolean or did the Ashmolean come to you as someone who's always been very supportive of the Ashmolean? How, how did that come about? Well, um, we're huge fans as a family of, of the uh, Ashmolean, and yeah. uh, it was a really conversation that I had with Zar Sturgis, who's the director of the Ashmolean, yeah. um, about two years ago. And um, uh, we ascertained that no other museum was going to celebrate Hans Koper's 100th um, yeah. year of birth. Which is and surprising, uh, really. Consider. It is, it is yeah. very surprising. Um, and we thought it would 
be a good idea, but it had to have, a, you know, a USP. It had to be had, had to have a unique selling point. Yeah. And, um, and we threw in a couple of unique selling points. Actually, we uh, first of all, you know, made sure it was really about Hans Cooper because there's so many shows, you know, include Lucy Ree. Yeah. This is really dedicated to Hans and the evolution of his work. Um, the first thing. The second thing is that it's done in conjunction with um, his wife's um, photographs, Jane Coper. And Jane with Jane's Cooper. work, that's all, of course, yeah. And she was very talented in her own right. And um, the photographs that she took of him and his parts are very evocative of, of that 60s, 70s period. Mm -hmm. I think they are wonderfully grainy and fantastic. Oh, they're amazing quality to the photographs. They're incredible, aren't they? They really are. And um, we have a catalogue that was produced by the um, Ashmolean. And um, if any listeners wants to purchase one, um, <laughs> the uh, proceeds would be gratefully received by the Ashmolean. Um, uh, and they have wonderful images in, in, the, in that catalogue yeah. of, of her photographs. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is the fact that it is surrounded by these wonderful ancient works from ancient Greece. Uh, so it sits very comfortably in, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the, the home of inspiration. Yeah, uh, well, they have such a timeless quality, his works, don't they? I don't feel they're, you know, there are many artworks produced that become very much you know, a, a symbol of that era. Whereas I, I think there's such a classical quality to Coper's work that I don't feel that they have they don't pinpoint to, to any age. And I think it's perhaps because there is that link back to antiquity in its inspiration, but also in the modern art of its time and the modern art that was to come. And I think it, it has helped, kind of, it, it hasn't aged in any way, which I think is really interesting. And I think in that kind of context of the Ashmolean, where you have that broad range of artworks on show, it sits really beautifully in that context. I, I think you're exactly right. I'm not sure if you had all your listeners had the chance to go to see the Odunde show at uh, Yeah, York. it was amazing. Um, they had some wonderful pieces from Hans Koper there next to a Mirandi uh, painting. Yeah. So there yeah. was a sort of still life composition. Um, but one of the, um, the uh, discs on the wall just spoke about this timeless quality of Hans Koper and, and the fact that they often, some of the pots appear as if they could have been easily found from out of a tomb in, in uh, ancient Greece. They, yeah. They, they're utterly timeless, and um, and I think they will carry on being so in the future. Yeah, um, they have this wonderful distilled nature to them, um, and um, yeah, they're very very serene in their own right. They really are, and I'm interested. So I know that you're a collector yourself. You have a private collector as well, and obviously that's where you're in. His, where, where did you first come across Coper's work? How, how were you first introduced to him, and, and what then drew you, drew you to him? I had a very enlightened uh, um, sculpture pottery teacher at school. Oh, okay. uh, uh, she introduced me to Lucy Ree, not physically, mm -hmm. uh, no. the idea of Lucy Ree and Hans Cooper. Um, and um, I was obviously, you know, too young to, to, to purchase one at the time. Um, but um, that sparked an interest, and um, and I followed his his um, you know, learnt what I could about his pots that stage and then um you know that, that sparked an interest in the rest of, yeah. rest of modern ceramics as well okay. and so do you have how, how broad is your focus with your with your own collection obviously kind of cope has played a big part in it for you but what what other ceramic artists feature in in your collection do you have favorites there uh i have many favorites i um, know <laughs> it's a difficult question isn't it <laughs> <laughs> favorite um uh I, um, I, I, I'm a huge admirer of, of um, James Tower, mm. um, Lucy Ree, um, and uh, some of the, you know, very modern, uh, more modern, um, uh, Felicia Aliff, um, yeah. Philip Eaglin. Um, I mean, I think the wonderful thing about pottery is that they're all, you know, so talented um, mm. and, uh, um, so different in their output. Um, mm. You know, we've got to remember that Hans Cooper taught in two schools of, of yeah, um, and uh, a lot of his not disciples but his students. Um, <laughs> uh, their their production is so different. Uh, Elizabeth Rich, uh, yeah, 
name one with the student, but her work is utterly different from anything that Cooper produced. But I think uh, he was he was so free as a teacher. I think he 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 paved a way because obviously he was breaking new ground, wasn't he? With although he was very much wheel based focused and therefore had the symmetry that working with a wheel kind of dictates almost. He was one of the first to do the to to, to reconstruct the wheel by throwing elements and and was all really one of the first Absolutely. hand builders yeah. as a result of that and yeah. i think that broke such new ground and opened up so many new pathways for the pupils that he would then go on to teach that i think especially considering how dominant the kind of the leech tradition had been and the anglo-oriental tradition had been before it it really opened up a world for people and a world of possibilities that and i think him being quite a he wasn't a forceful character by any means, but just hugely encouraging, which I'm sure must have been very liberating as a teacher um, for his pupils. And like you say, they've, they've gone on to do such a wide disparity of works um, that there isn't really one school following it really anymore, is there? But it's, it's that freedom that he gave them, which I think is so inspiring. I think, I think yeah, he, he, he taught by, by, by inspiration, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he, and uh, I did have the chance. Um, one person we haven't spoken about is Alison Britton, who, who uh, was very kind and very helpful with the this particular exhibition, and volunteered to come and give a, a chat about Hans Kober, who had taught her. Oh, amazing! Uh, and um, sadly, COVID put put an end to that. But um, <laughs> but she described him, and she writes very well. Uh, and when we spoke, she described Hans as being, you know, very humble, but very, um, you know, inspirational teacher. Mm. And, um, that's the, that's the, that's the nature of the man, I think. Um, he yeah. obviously was, uh, he wouldn't say do it this way or that way. It was, um, you know, have, you know, here's, this is what you've done, uh, you know, how, you know, how how can you how can you distill it more? How can you get the essence of what you're trying to create out? And that's what Hans Cooper was all about. It was all about getting retrieving the essence. Um, from, yeah. Um, I think in his own work and in the work of his pupils, really, isn't it? So, it is. Yeah. 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 And so, what hopes for the exhibition? Is is there? Is it just a question of? waiting to see when things might reopen or obviously there's a, a book that's been published which hopefully will give people who haven't or won't have the opportunity to come and see it will uh, hopefully be able to enjoy and acquire the book as you said before is that available through the Ashmolean website or where can people it, buy that book it is indeed it's uh, available through okay. the website um yeah and um uh, and also some wonderful postcards uh, all from Jane Gates photographs. Um, oh, amazing! Uh, it's not a huge book, but it, I think it uh, captures the um, the spirit of the exhibition. Um, yeah. And um, uh, Jane Gate uh, went round the exhibition um, before it closed down for the second time, um, yeah. and seemed to be very pleased with the exhibition. Uh, so I was very glad about that. Um, and. Um, so postcards and catalogue available, but I yeah. hope that that um, people will get a chance to go to the Ashmolean, which um, yeah. which is a, a very you know it's a very special museum. It's it's very eclectic, um, yeah. but it really shows off some of their ancient work as well as um, the work of Hans Cooper. And I hope that with the Ashmolean, um, it's a discussion for you know for the future, but um, you know that we might be able to you know introduce more. Um, modern ceramics um, yeah. on a more permanent basis. Um, you know, the Fitzwilliam obviously has a, an incredible collection of uh, contemporary ceramics and they sit very well with the their existing collection. And I hope yeah. that we might be able to do something similar with the Ashmolean, but that's... Um, that's an ongoing sure. discussion, I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think yeah. I just saw a question pop up actually on the stream here with someone asking whether there might be an opportunity for an online virtual viewing of the exhibition if if in the case that lockdown doesn't allow things to open or um, but there's some good there's some great imagery on the website on the Ashmolean website where you can see photographs of the installation in situ am I right or is it James photographs as well that are there on the website as well so it's certainly worth worth a visit 
to get a bit of a sense of, of what's there. Yeah, there is a there is a video that was sent out to the patrons of, of the Ashmolean Museum. Um, okay. I think lots of museums are trying to, um, whether it's the National Gallery or the Ashmolean or Fitzwilliam, they're yeah. all to um, engage uh, the audience that hasn't been able to go um, to these museums yeah. via video um, meetings. Um, and um, uh, the video has been done. Uh, it's not very long. It's, it's sort of 10 minutes. It's a conversation between myself and, and Zaster, the director of yeah. the Ashmolean. I, I don't know, it, I think it was sent out on YouTube, but I'm afraid I'm not so technically... No, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> it's on general, general release we'll, yet. We'll um, see what we uh, can do. Now, if there's any way of sharing that with people on a broader level, then obviously we'd love to help with that because it would be a great opportunity for people to see it. So. Well, that would be good. Um, Patrick yeah. can speak after the call. and. Um, yeah, can, absolutely. Absolutely. Not with that. <laughs> no, whatever we can do, it'd be great. Well, I think, Charlie, thank you so much for joining me today for Mac Monday. And I'm really glad we've had an opportunity to talk about the collection, talk about the exhibition, and, and hopefully um, we'll all have a chance to go and walk around and see the pots together before the end of February. Um, very much hoping that we can and hoping that anyone else who's out there and listening gets a chance to do the same. But in the meantime, do check out the Ashmolean website and uh, buy the book and obviously any questions then do approach us all and love to discuss it further with anyone who's got any questions afterwards but Charlie thank you it's been lovely to talk to you and um, we'll catch up again really very soon thanks Marika all right thanks Charlie okay. bye bye